times have been hard recently for the HD community. We've spent decades waiting for the promise of a def definitive treatment for HD, and it has eluded us again. I hope that I can share with you my enthusiasm that what looks like a failure can be a new opportunity. We have always needed to attack HD on all fronts, not just one single hope of a miracle. Over my career, I have focused on utilizing treatments that are currently available to change the live experience of people and families with HD. I still believe that there is more that we can do. As I think about this latest disappointment, I look back at all that has happened in the years I've been part of the HD effort. We now have the technology to assist parents who want to bring a gene negative child into the world. HD research is funded at an unprecedented level. Thanks to the people who funded CHDI, we have been able to explore every possible good idea at the research bench and in the clinic. CHDI remains committed to cure Huntington's disease. That is their only focus. What this means is that we, the HD community, can devote our energies to things besides clinical research. What disease community has that opportunity? We can learn from other diseases using interventions that have been found useful to manage symptoms similar to HD symptoms. Medication management can treat both psychiatric and motor symptoms that impact quality of life. Ancillary treatments and psychotherapy can be employed to prevent complications of HD, like maintaining nutritional health to prevent malnutrition, gait and balance training to prevent falls, psychotherapy to identify and manage depression and anxiety in both patient and caregiver. Family education describing non-pharmacologic non interventions can make home a better place to live. We have a number of school uh, skills in our toolbox. HD is a complicated disease, no doubt about it. One reason it is complicated is that the neurons that are most vulnerable to the abnormal Huntington protein called Huntington are medium spiny neurons, a specific type of brain cell. 95% of the cells in the caudate nucleus a deep brain structure that interconnects different brain areas are made up of medium spiny neurons. You can see the caudate in the, the red um, structures within my little spinning man. The caudate nucleus is a pivotal switching station that connects cells from a number of different circuits in the brain. It's like the computer that coordinates Grand Central Station in New York City. If that computer lost power or was overrun with commuters, the whole New York subway system would slow down or stop altogether. Another way to look at what the caudate does is to use the metaphor of a gate. If the gate is open, things can easily move in and out through the gate. If the gate is closed, things will stop and back up before the gate. The caudate uses this gate to slow down behavior, whether it's motor behavior, cognitive speed, or emotional behavior. In the normal state, the caudate does this so flawlessly that we only use it unconsciously. We really don't have to pay any attention to it at all. If the caudate gate, gate is injured or impaired, it opens and closes unreliably, causing behavior that is too fast, for example, chorea, or impulsivity, or shuts it down altogether. Dystonia, an involuntary movement that the person gets stuck in, or apathy. The skills we want to talk about today are ways to compensate for the gates that open and close inconsistently. First, you need to know that you have abilities, thanks to the caudate nucleus, that don't require your conscious input you aren't aware you have them. You don't know how you multitask, you just do it. You don't know why you can fluidly move across the room to get a glass of water, you just do it. You don't know, how that, you, you don't know how that your brain is sequencing your movements in order to achieve a goal, you just do it. It's hard to understand skills that you have, but you are unaware of them. It's even harder to imagine how you would think 
if you didn't possess these skills or if these skills deteriorated slowly over time. That's how cognitive decline affects a person with HD. Cognitive speed slows down. Multitasking becomes harder. Recalling information is less efficient. You can't seem to get going on a task. Words you think you wouldn't say when you're, you were healthy come flying out of your mouth. The caudate nucleus and striatum are closely connected to your prefrontal cortex and mesolimbic areas. These areas collectively house so cognit uh, social cognition, the color and consequences of behavior cast upon social interactions. For example, an early finding in psychological testing is loss of facial recognition of emotions, particularly negative emotions like anger or disgust. Inattention to nonverbal behaviors, hand gestures, leaning forward to engage a person are often missed by the person with HD. This has a significant impact on social interactions between spouses, parent and child, or be between worker and boss. Around the time a person transitions from manifest HD to motor symptoms like chorea, awareness of symptoms begin to decline. Remember that these specialized skills housed in the caudate and striatum are unconsciously doing their job, so you don't need to pay attention to every bit of data coming at you. It makes sense that a person with HD would be unaware of a skill they are losing. This is what causes unawareness. The most striking example of this um, came from a man who told me that he never experienced chorea and didn't know he had it until he looked in the mirror. The same is true for cognitive and, and psychiatric symptoms or behaviors. The only difference being that these symptoms, our mirror is, the other, is other people. What we say and how we say it is a critical part of communication. Inflection, cadence, pace, rhythm of speech, and pauses for emphasis give color and meaning to what we say. For a person with HD, speech is irregular, both in production and volume. Involuntary inspiration during speech may produce quiet or paused speech. One of the hardest aspects is latency. Talking with someone with HD must be intentional, waiting with patience for the person to respond to a question so as to not interrupt the cognitive effort required in producing a response. Speech is also a clue to irregular cognition. If I want to know how many pauses there are in thinking, my cognitive slowing, I just listen to speech. It's like a window into the brain. Mental health symptoms do not always track with disease progression, especially with symptoms that overlap with common conditions like major depression and generalized anxiety disorder. Irritability in HD, however, is a unique symptom. Irritability is defined as an abrupt, unprompted, intense moment of rage followed by long periods of calm. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Perseveration can look like OCD, but it's really a biologically mediated closed loop in a brain circuit that a person with HD simply cannot stop without an outside distractor. Apathy is the, consequences, is the consequence of a nearly completely stuck, closed gate in the striatum. Apathy, perseveration, and irritability do track with disease progression. So where do we begin? Before we get to actual skills, I want to consider some general factors. An HD behavior may irritate or frighten you. So before you decide what to do, there are some general things to consider. First, label the problem. Once you know that the behavior is not willful, you have options you wouldn't consider otherwise. Second, approach the problem with positive intent giving the person the benefit of the doubt about their intentions. Third, what might have triggered the event? What are triggers in HD anyway? Fourth, who is the person with the problem? Are you the one with the problem 
that is. I can't get you out of the door on time and I'm angry. Or is it a problem for the person with HD? I am disappointing you once more and it makes me feel so inadequate and sad. Finally, review your safety plan. We will talk about this in a minute too. This will prompt you to think about calling the doctor or a therapist to decide if a new medication or intervention will help. It will also help you consider urgency and what is the best location for care of the person with HD or for you. Label the problem. So I told you we would talk about irritability in a minute and that's because it is so common in HD. In fact, it often occurs years before a person develops motor signs of the disease. It's characterized by brief outbursts of rage followed by long periods of calm. It's triggered by modest or trivial stimuli. There's usually no buildup. It's not premeditated. It doesn't involve any planning. It serves no obvious goal or aim. The person is often upset after the outburst, concerned, embarrassed, as opposed to blaming others or justifying behaviors. The second thing to consider is positive intent. Positive intent is defined as the belief that a person means well and is doing their best regardless of what they say or do. Another way of looking at that is to say all human behavior is explainable considering the underlying disease process, prior experiences, personality traits, and current stressors. I love um, this book that Rebecca Wallace called When Someone You Love Has a Mental Illness because I think it, it creates such a compassionate approach um, and has great suggestions as well. And one thing she says is that crucial to learning to cope effectively with mental illness is having others who believe in you and have hope and confidence that you can live a meaningful life. I think that's really important. And finally, Vicki Hunt, who used to work with Francis Walker at the Wake Forest University HD clinic and taught me so much about Huntington's disease, summed it up perfectly. Having HD is really, really hard work. Triggers are internal factors or environmental factors that stress the person with HD. These can include hunger, fatigue, change in routine, intercurrent illness like a cold or fever, medication issues like missing a dose of medication or taking too much of a medication, dehydration, and pain. Don't ever forget pain. Some things that are a little bit less common triggers but nonetheless important include recent losses, holidays and other special events, political or civic events, and changes in the lives of important family members. I've asked this question before, who is the person with the problem right now? At HD Reach, we always ask ourselves with every person we talk with, who is the identified patient? Who is the person who has the problem? Um, logical reasoning rarely works to help a person with a fixed brain impairment. If you're using this as a strategy, you're the only one who can fix that problem. The second is, do you actually need to intervene? So pick your battles. It's okay to walk away, take a break and calm down to care for yourself. Don't take HD behaviors personally. I know how hard this is to do, but it's really important. Your behavior in response to HD behaviors matters, but you aren't the cause of the behavior. And finally, safety concerns are always a reason to intervene. Safety plans, um, are like life insurance or disability insurance or uh, other forms of insurance. There are ways that you hope for the best, but you plan for the worst. Um, it's a, a written document that you stick on your refrigerator and, and in it, it uh, includes um, all kinds of different facts. But basically it prepares for how to get help um, and and you need to do that. You need to ask your doctor, therapist, family members, friends, or neighbors for help in advance. This, the form lists these, uh, how, how you would get in touch with these people and what their phone numbers are. 
you need to create a safety plan before an emergency arises, not afterwards, not during. Openly discuss medications in a non-judgmental way at the beginning of a medication being prescribed. That way, if something comes up that's a safety concern later on, you will already have open communication about that medication. Talk about suicidal feelings. This is really important. It's very connecting with the person who has them and it does not increase the risk of suicide. In fact, it decreases the risk of suicide. I would suggest that there be no weapons um, uh, in the home um, for a lot of reasons. Um, although I know that in, this, in the world of violence and turmoil that we live in, that some people keep weapons for self-defense. And I would just like to argue that you compare the risk of someone outside your home harming you versus the risk of harm from an impulsive um, and irritable person living inside your home. Finally, violence and self-harm is virtually never acceptable. There has to be a change in plan. When tensions are high, you can control yourself. Manage your emotions, stay calm, use an even soft tone of voice, use a non-threatening body stance, stand relaxed or sit relaxed, arms down at your sides, not crossed and not on your hips. Give the person with HD space. Let the upset person do most of the talking. Don't fight back. Don't try to reason with a distraught person. Try not to touch them. If you must, tell the person what you're going to do. Remove noise and distractions. That in and of itself can, can cause um, HD behaviors. And finally, excuse other people from the room. That will allow the person with Huntington's disease to more closely pay attention to you. Now, finally, to skills. Um, I'm just gonna list these. We're gonna cover each one of these as, as um, we go through this. Um, so the first is to ignore behavior redirect the person away from the behavior, set limits, do a paired stimulus plan, remove access to a behavior, and learn new behaviors, and then what to do in a crisis. If a behavior is neurologic in origin, ignoring it will not change the behavior. In fact, it may result in escalation. If a behavior is motivated in part by the person's desire to gain attention or other positive responses from another person, simply ignoring the behavior may be an option. Waiting for a person to work through a problem is always the better idea. It dignifies the hard work of living with HD and gives the person with HD an opportunity for success. Redirection is probably the most important skill that I'm going to tell you about today. It's the most effective with the largest number of HD behaviors. First, change the subject. Um, start a new activity. Move to a different place. Give the person a new job. Place an object like a key or other item in the person's hand as a cue to move on. Use emotion emotionally neutral activities as the key to redirection neither highly desirable or unpleasant, just totally neutral. Sometimes setting limits will also be helpful, especially for people with perseveration. Give the person one or two tickets for a perseverative topic or activity, and when the tickets are gone, the topic or activity is no longer allowed. For example, you could give people daily tickets for phone calls. One of the things as people's um, care needs begin to increase, they start to call family members or caregivers repeatedly throughout the day. Um, if you decide that person doesn't or you can't get them extra help for whatever reason, um, you can give daily tickets for phone calls. That is five calls for one person, five calls for another person and color code those, those different tickets. Limit setting is, also, is often useful for people who benefit from perseveration becoming a deliberate focus of attention. In other words, switching a negative perseveration to a positive perseveration. And then finally, sometimes you just need to say, no, we're not gonna talk about this anymore and dramatically terminate it. You can just do this. No, we're not talking about this anymore. 
paired stimulus plans work great. When a person resists a required behavior like hygiene or taking medicine or whatever, pair that activity with a pleasant activity or memory with a new behavior that you'd like for them to do. For example, singing favorite songs together with shaving or bathing um, are a great way to uh, remain emotionally connected to somebody while you're getting the job done. Paired stimuli, stimulus um, plans should always be sensory, visual, auditory, taste, that type of thing. Another option is to remove access, especially when there's safety concerns um, involved. Remove the opportunity or access um, to a behavior by having the car stolen or dismantled. Park the family car someplace else and take the bus or bike to the car when needed or carpool. Have law enforcement search the house <clears throat> when you and the person with HD are away to remove weapons. Put all medications in a lockbox or safe and dispense medications one day at a time. Learn new behaviors. Behaviors can be gradually modified in people with frontal lobe dis disorders like HD. That is that the caregiver enters the activity with the person and adds additional elements to the activity slowly over time. Use the activity to gradually teach new, less problematic behaviors like folding or stacking washcloths instead of obsessively walking around the room. So you're expending less energy sitting there folding and stacking those washcloths by burning energy by walking around the room. It's often better learned with a sensory or a tactile behavior. What do you do when things are going badly wrong? Well, the first thing that you can do is call 911. But if you do that, ask for a CIT trained officer to respond or a CIT team. Um, a CIT trained individual, that's a crisis intervention training program that um, public servants go through to learn to de-escalate people with mental health um, illnesses. If you don't do that, you're gonna have a cop who may arrive and think that the person is intoxicated and just you know, um, being belligerent and non-cooperative. So um, asking for a CIT trained officer basically tells 911 that you need somebody to respond to a behavioral health crisis. So, one option, although it needs to be after all else fails, is um, admission to a psychiatric facility. So each state has their own laws about this. In North Carolina, anybody can petition for evaluation, but you need to be ready to provide important facts about dangerousness or inability for that person to care for themselves. The evaluation by a psychiatrist or other qualified mental health professional is the only involuntary part. It does not mean that you are involuntarily putting that person in the hospital. You are simply putting them in the care of a psychiatrist who will determine what is the correct location for care. Hospital admission is not always a therapeutic intervention. It's just an interim safety measure to get medications on board, for you to arrange a better outpatient program, that kind of thing. If you're having trouble with medication compliance, there's a couple of different tricks you can use. One is to ask your doctor to, pres to prescribe a long acting medication in an injection or to use um, a weekly dose of Prozac, a very, very high dose, but only once a week. Or it could, you could use combination medications um, like Prozac and Olanzapine comes in a, a, a medication called Symbiax, which is one pill a day rather than two pills a day. So when I was in training at Duke during my residency, my, my residency director knew I was struggling with how I was going to take care of myself if I worked with HD families. She said, Mary, have you ever thought that this could be your gift? There are few people that have your skill set to manage HD sim symptoms. But I knew that there would be constant reminders of HD, and I was going to need to do something to recharge myself all the time. I see lots of caregivers and healthcare professionals who become exhausted because they care so much and work so hard. I really know that feeling. So I'm here to say, you can't do this alone. 
You need your own space, support, and re frequent revitalizations. You need more people to help you than just one. You need more support than other people might. On a day-to-day -day basis, the single best thing you can do is meditate. So I've, um, I've put a, a reference here for a book um, by a guy by the name of McKay called Dialectical Behavioral Therapy Skills Training Workbook. It's got all kinds of great exercises in it. Um, and I would also suggest that you don't forget apps. For example, Insight Timer is really a great um, meditation app and um, also includes guided meditations for people who are just getting started. So in summary, judge the behavior, don't judge the person. Work harder at making things go right than correcting things when they're going wrong. Address emotions before you start working on solutions. Develop an individual creative safety plan. Ask for help. No one person can manage all the various problems associated with HD alone. And finally, actively take care of yourself. And I think with some of these things that I've suggested today, we can all have hope that HD will be different in you, in the next generation of people who work and live with Huntington's disease. The natural history of HD can be altered in our lifetime by better treatment of chorea, psychiatric, and behavioral symptoms. Irritability, aggression, depression, and suicide, to name a few of the behavioral and psychiatric problems of HD, are better understood and better treated now than ever. ever. Today's children and HD families can experience a different disease than their affected parents did as a child. Without misinformation, violence, and with support, they will have less to fear and can live more peaceful lives. Thank you for attending the 2021 HD Hive Education Conference. Thank you so much.